Tonight's Bible reading will be from Joshua chapter 14 and 15. We'll be reading the whole of 14 and different bits of 15. So if you could open up your Bibles, open up your phones. Joshua chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Now these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritances were as assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Moses had granted the two and a half tribes their inheritance east of the Jordan, but had not granted the Levites an inheritance among the rest. For the sons of Joseph had become two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Levites received no share of the land, but only towns to live in, with pasture lands for their flocks and herds. So the Israelites divided the land, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. The allotment for the tribe of Judah, clan by clan, extended down to the territory of Edom, to the desert of Zin in the extreme south. Now we'll be reading from verse 13. To verse 19 in chapter 15. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, descendants of Anak. From there, he marched against the people living in Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sepa. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sephar. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day, when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. And our last passage is verse 63. Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. This is the word of the Lord. Well, today we're carrying on with Joshua. Uh, we've been doing that series in the evening services, and we're, we're covering all of Joshua 
chapter 14 and 15, but we had a bit of a selection of reading, so hopefully you could gather the, the main picture of what's going on in, the chapter, in those chapters, and we'll see a bit more as well as we go through. Um, there is a lot to cover. I've been deeply challenged by some of the things in these chapters, and there is a lot to cover, and I hope some of those challenges can come across. I hope they can uh, come across to you tonight as well. So let's pray for God's help, and then we'll look at it. Our great God, we are so aware of our need of your help and we just seek it right now. We ask that your spirit would be working in us. We are so weak. Uh, We are unable at times to see you and the wonder of your word and the wonder of what you are teaching us. And so we pray that you would open our eyes right now. Help us to see what it is you have to say to us. And please, God, bring about in us conviction. Please challenge us. Please, by your Spirit, rebuke us and change us. And we pray all of these things, God, for your glory and for our good. Amen. In 1839, John Williams and James Harris went as missionaries to a group of islands that we know today as Vanuatu. And as far as we know, they were the first Christian influence in that area. And a few minutes after arriving on shore of this island, they were killed and eaten by cannibals. About 19 years later, a man named John Patton went to this same group of islands with his family, and he was criticized by so many for going. He had a really fruitful evangelistic ministry, and he was criticized by many for going, and they said, you're going to be eaten, and you're going to be a waste, a waste of a good life. A few months after being on the island, his wife unexpectedly died, and then his son died a week later, and much of Patton's time on the island was full of sickness and hardship and hostility from the people. He had people rushing at him at times with knives and axes. He spent days in the trees hiding from people who were trying to kill him, the same people he'd been helping so again and again, day after day. Yet through all of that he, everything that he faced, all the hardship that he faced, he continued to wholeheartedly follow God in it. What enabled him to do this? What enabled him to be like that? Well, it was the fact that he had a deep faith in God, and in particular, he he trusted God's promises. And there was one in particular that he came back to again and again, and he trusted upon. It was Matthew 28, verse 20, where Jesus says, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. John Patton writes this, and it shows his trust in this promise. He says, Without that abiding consciousness of the presence and power of my dear Lord and Saviour, nothing else in all the world could have preserved me from losing my reason and perishing miserably. In his words, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, became so real to me that it would not have startled me to behold him as Stephen did, gazing down upon the scene. I felt his supporting power. It is a sober truth and it comes back to me sweetly after 20 years that I had my nearest and dearest glimpses of his face and smiles in those dreaded moments when musket, club or spear were being levelled at my life. He had a deep trust in this promise that his Lord, Jesus, was with him to the end of the age and this enabled him to wholeheartedly follow God in extreme circumstances. He was a man who wholeheartedly followed God with the desire to see the salvation of souls. He was courageous and he clung to God's promises and that is what enabled him to endure through it. We need today people like that. We need John Pattons among us who will be wholehearted in following God, people who will cling to God's promises And that will will enable this wholehearted following of him. And as we look at our passage tonight, we're going to see another man who wholeheartedly followed God. And I want you to ask the question tonight, do I wholeheartedly follow God? Do I wholeheartedly follow God? Do you even follow God? Would your life be characterized by that right now? Or do you half-heartedly follow God? What would people say about you and how you walk with God? What do you say about yourself? And more importantly, what would God say about you and how you follow Him? 
For Caleb, we see that other people say he wholeheartedly followed God. He says it about himself and God says it as well about him. He was a man who wholeheartedly followed God. And I want us to think as we look at him, is this me? Am I like this? Would someone say this about me and would God say this about me? And we need to think like this because we can't fool God. He knows how we're following him. Other people we might be able to put on a bit of a show for, but God knows how you are following him. He knows it. So to begin, let's, let's jump into the story a bit and just ga- gather the, the story that's going on so far, and then we're going to focus a bit more on Caleb. So here in Joshua, we are at a high point in the book, and really a high point in Israel's history. They have, Joshua has now conquered the land, they've conquered much of the land, and they've come out of slavery, as we know. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they failed to take the land when they should have. They failed to trust God when they should have. So they wandered for 40 years because of their sin. But now they're at a point where they've knocked out many of the inhabitants of the land and they're about to take the promised land. This promised land that God had promised hundreds of years before. That's why it's called the promised land. And our passage here begins in chapter 14 and it's really beginning a lengthy section on them receiving this land and this land being distributed to them. It's particularly focused on the nine and a half tribes who, who receive the land east, west, east of the Jordan, sorry, west of the Jordan. So before we've already seen in chapter 13, two and a half tribes receive part of their land east of the Jordan. And we can see this straight away in, in chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Have a look and you'll see this clearly. Chapter 14, Joshua 14, verse 1 and 2. Now these are the areas of the Israelites, these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar, the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritances were assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Now this here is the first time that Eleazar the priest appears in Joshua. He's the son of Aaron and he's one of the men that God commanded back in Numbers to distribute the land. And this is a significant moment for Israel in their history, as I've been saying. This is really what they've been longing and waiting for, for hundreds of years. It's finally come. And they've already seen some of the land distributed, like I said, in chapter 13. And verses 3 and 4 of chapter 14 now mention that and explain that a little bit more. And so now the rest of the tribes are about to receive what they've been longing for and what they've hoped for. And now there are so many things we could consider here. We could look and discuss the big purposes in this section of what it is to receive the distribution and some of the big points that come behind this, uh, some of the purposes of what is happening when they are allocated the land and when they receive this inheritance and the application for us. And I think that'll come out a bit more clearly in a few weeks, which we'll cover, particularly in chapter 18 and 19 and 21 as well. We could also look here at the Levites, why they don't receive any of the land, but that's going going to be covered as well in chapter 21. Or we could discuss here, if you noticed, in verse 2, how lots are cast to bring about this distribution of the land. There's so much to dig there. What does that mean for us today? Well, that's actually going to get covered. I'll cover in a couple of weeks in chapter 18 because it comes up a lot more. But I don't want to focus on those things and there's so many more things we could focus on. Instead, I want to focus on, in this passage, I want to focus on Caleb in chapter 14 and contrast him to Judah and how they receive their inheritance in chapter 15, which is really a picture of all of Israel and how they receive their inheritance because there is a contrast here between Caleb and the rest of Israel. Now, let me give a quick summary of the whole flow of the two chapters so you can really see what's going on. Hopefully, you've already picked it up, but have a look. Firstly, in verse 1 to 5 of chapter 14, we're just given the foundation of what's happening in this section, which I've already mentioned. Then, verses 6 to 15, we see Caleb come forward and demand what he has been promised, this inheritance for him, because he's wholeheartedly followed God. Then, chapter 15, verse 1 to 12, define the borders of Judah's inheritance, where they receive their land and what section they get. Uh, And you can have a look if you want 
in your maps at the back of your Bible and you'll see the section they get. Then verse 13 to 19 in chapter 15, talk about Caleb getting his portion of the land and they re- it reaffirms that there. And then verse 20 to 62, we see all the different clans and all the towns they receive, which we we didn't get to read, but you see all those towns that they received. And then it ends in verse 63, and it mentions that they can't remove the Jebusites from the land. It's a bit of an overview of the the whole two chapters, just so you know what's going on, because we're going to be jumping and digging at a few different parts. And I want us to first begin with chapter 15 and see the inheritance that Judah receives, and then contrast it with Caleb and what he's like. So have a look now in chapter 15 and we're going to see here the inheritance that Judah receives. And if you take note here and if you look at the back of your Bible and you'll see that the section that they, they receive, you'll realize that it's quite a big section. It seems like they're, they're getting this special privilege, these, this special provision here with this huge section of land and they're the first ones as well to receive it. Why is this? Why was it like this for Judah? Well, the, the first reason is probably most clearly because they're in the southern part of the kingdom and they're moving up through the land and it's the first one to distribute. That's probably one of the big reasons. But also, back in Genesis, Judah received a great blessing from Jacob. And we see there a great importance put on Judah It's in the line of King David. Eventually, Jesus comes from that line and there's a special importance put on Judah again and again throughout the Bible. Why is this? There was nothing special in them. There was nothing special in Judah. It was just that God was gracious to them. Really, the only reason any of Israel received the land and the only reason Judah received this oversized uh, portion was because God was gracious to them. That's the only reason. God was good to them. He defeated their enemies, though they didn't deserve it. And I think this here just reminds us of our undeserved salvation. God is gracious to us. That is the only reason we are saved. It's not because you are beautiful and worthy of it or amazing in any way. It's not because of that. You're God's enemy. Even your very best is like a filthy rag before God. It's not because you're wonderful that God saved you, but it is amazing grace. It really is. It's a free gift, an undeserved gift. That is why we're saved. And it's the same here with Judah. They aren't anything special. That's not why they get such a great portion of land. It's just because God is gracious, just like he's been gracious to us in saving us. And verse 63 really shows it. They weren't different to the rest of Israel. They weren't different to the other tribes. The other tribes struggled to knock out certain inhabitants of the land and Judah faced this same trouble. We're going to see that with the other tribes in the coming weeks. Judah faced this same trouble though. Verse 63 says, chapter 15, verse 63, Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. They can't fully conquer the land. And for generations to come, they have to deal with this and put up with this, the consequence of these other nations living in the land among them. John Calvin, he says here about this verse, and it's very helpful, so listen carefully. He says, Had they, so had Judah, exerted themselves to the full measure of their strength and failed of success, so if they had worked hard to knock out the, the Jebusites and failed, he's saying, the dishonor would have fallen on God himself, who had promised that he would continue with them as their leader until he should give them full and free possession of the land. Therefore, it was owing entirely to their own sluggishness that they did not make themselves masters of the city of Jerusalem. Their own inactivity, their neglect of the divine command because of a love of ease, were the real obstacles to them receiving all the land. This is what stopped them from receiving the land. Now, we don't see that in chapter 15, but I think we see that when we compare it to Caleb in chapter 14. Because Caleb did receive what he was promised, and he did knock out all the inhabitants, unlike Judah and the other tribes. And it's because of what Caleb was like, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. 
And that was Judah's problem and Israel's problem as well. They didn't wholeheartedly follow God. And so now we, I want to contrast Judah and really all of Israel to Caleb and what he is like. And by looking at him, we are going to see how to not miss out and jeopardize receiving the fullness of God's promises. So now back to 14, back to chapter 14. I want us to see here Caleb's inheritance and how he wholeheartedly followed God. Have a look at verse 6 in chapter 14. It says, Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. It was 40 year, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me the land on which your feet have walked swore to me that day, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now this, these verses here, they're referring back 45 years ago, back to Numbers 13 and 14. And this is at a time where Israel was ready to enter the promised land and they sent out 12 spies to spy out the land and the spies came back and 10, 10 of them said, no, it's too hard It's too hard to take the inhabitants on. There's giants there. The cities are fortified. We can't do it. It's too hard. But Joshua and Caleb stood up and they said, no, we can. Caleb says this in Numbers 13, verse 30. We should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. And then in chapter 14, Numbers 14, verse 7 to 9, he says, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we shall swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. That's what Caleb says, but the people don't listen. They melt with fear and they rebel against God and because of it, they are in the wilderness for 40 years. And so God says in Numbers 14, verse 23 to 24, after they rebel, he says, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. So Caleb doesn't melt with fear. He stands strong and he is courageous And he's promised an inheritance because he wholeheartedly followed God. And so here in Joshua 14, now we see this promise is being kept. That's what's happening. Now when we go from Numbers 14 now to Joshua 14, that promise is being kept. And Caleb is coming forward and he's wanting that land that he was promised. And the question I ask as I read Joshua 14, and hopefully you do as well, the question I ask is, what does it mean to wholeheartedly follow God. What does that mean and what enables it? What does it mean to wholeheartedly follow God? Because three times it said, it said about Joshua, uh, about Caleb in Joshua 14, that he wholeheartedly followed God. So what does it mean? We need to understand it because we see here Joshua is blessed, he receives this inheritance, the enemies are cast out because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Verse 14 makes it clear. Have a look at Joshua 14, verse 14, it makes it very clear. It says, So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Caleb received this because he followed God wholeheartedly. So what is it to follow God wholeheartedly? What does that mean? Because we're throwing it around a lot and saying it a lot. Well, we're going to look at Caleb to see this in chapter 14, but I want to first say a few points to show us what it is. Wholehearted following. There's a few points here about wholehearted following. Wholehearted following is fueled by faith in God. And we see this with Joshua. 
Wholehearted following is fueled by faith in God. Something we need to realize is that God desires from all of us as his people a total, total, total surrender to him and our allegiance to him as Lord. But the only way that that can come is by faith in him. Where you're able to entrust everything that you are where you're able to entrust all of your life to all that he is and all that he has done. That's what it is to wholeheartedly follow God and the only way you will be able to do it is by faith in him. Wholehearted following of God is fueled by faith and it's at the centre of what Caleb has and what we see in him in chapter 14. It's what causes us, it's the only thing that can cause us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. It's the only thing that could cause us to want to follow him It's a faith in him, a trust in him, a seeing that he is worthy and has great worth. That's the only thing that could bring this about. So faith in God is needed to fuel this wholehearted following of him. Secondly, wholehearted following is complete. It's complete. It's a following that is full and complete, total and unswerving. It's to utterly and absolutely surrender to God with no reservations. It's not just to give Him everything you have, but it's actually to give Him all that you are. That's how complete it is. Not just to offer Him everything you've got, but actually offer Him the very being of who you are and surrender to Him your very life because it is His. We often surrender so much to our careers, so much to our families. We surrender so much to our hobbies and entertainment and give so much to these things. Imagine if we gave the same sort of time, energy, focus, and thought to God. If we surrendered to Him like that. Imagine if there was a person who was fully surrendered to God and His purposes. Imagine how they could be used. Imagine what they would look like, someone fully surrendered to God and being used by Him. I think something we need to do and pray, and I'm so often challenged to do this in my life, is pray this prayer and pray for God to take our life and use it as He wants. We need to pray that. God, take me. Use me as you please. My life is yours. I surrender my life, everything that I am to you. It's yours to use as you want. We don't often pray like that, but we should. We should pray like that, utterly surrendered to God, to be used by Him as He pleases. It's a frightening prayer. But the person who wholeheartedly follows God prays that. They pray that to God. If you haven't prayed that, I challenge you to go away tonight. At some point this week, go away. Spend time with God and say to Him, my life is yours. I give my life to you, for you to use it as you please. I surrender my life, everything that I am, all that I have to you. Do that, pray that, to surrender your life to God. So wholehearted following, it's fueled by a faith in God. Wholehearted following is complete. Wholehearted following as well is consistent. It's not just having this strong desire that comes after a sermon or after that really good camp or conference where you really want to follow God now. That's not wholehearted following, having that one-off strong desire. Wholehearted following is consistent. It's consistent. It carries on day after day, year after year. It continues no matter what circumstance you might be going through. Fourthly, wholehearted following is undivided. It's undivided loyalty to God. It is commitment to God, a committed focus on God. Matthew 6, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one, love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Wholehearted following is undivided. We can't be divided and serve something else if we say we are serving God and following him. It's undivided. And finally, wholehearted following is to lay aside your desires to do God's desires. That's what wholehearted following is. Jesus says we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And at the heart of following him is to lay aside what you want so that you can follow him. 
And so to sum it up, a bit of a definition of what is it to wholeheartedly follow God, because it's this phrase we could use but not really understand. What is it to wholeheartedly follow God? Well, to wholeheartedly follow God is to have a faith in God that allows you to completely, consistently, and undividedly do what He desires and not what you desire. A wholehearted following of God is fueled by a faith in God that allows you to completely, consistently, and undividedly lay aside your desires to be able to do what He desires. That's what it is to wholeheartedly follow God. Now let's look quickly at Caleb in chapter 14 and see some of those things in a bit of a different way, at a bit of a different angle, and see what characterized wholehearted following in him and what enabled it as well in him. Because I think as we go through these points, we're going to see each of these points is really telling us what characterizes wholehearted following in Caleb and as well what enables that in him. So those two questions will be answered as we go through these things. What characterized and enabled wholehearted following in Caleb? Well, it was a continual trust in God's strength. We've mentioned this a bit, but let's see it in Caleb. This is a big one here. We see it again and again in Caleb. He trusts that God is the one who can do these mighty acts, that God is the one who will be helping him. We saw it in Numbers 14. We see it here in Joshua 14. He trusts God. And he sees that God is the one of true worth who has the strength to be relied upon. And we need to realize here, it's really important, the hero isn't Caleb. The hero isn't him in his following of God. The hero is the one he follows. The fact that he wholeheartedly follows God shows the worth that is in God, not in Caleb. So don't look at Caleb and see him as great. See God through how he follows God. When when people pursue a guy or a girl because they like them. When you pursue a guy or a girl because you like them, it's because you see great worth in that person. And when you get to that point where you want to marry them and you maybe ask them, you ask them to marry you, it's showing how wonderful you think that person is. It's showing the worth that you see in that person. And here, when Caleb wholeheartedly follows God, it shows the great worth in God. Not great worth in Caleb. So we need to see that, see God and how great he is. He's the hero behind Caleb's wholehearted following. And he is trusting here God's strength as the one who can provide and as the one who is worth trusting. And we see this again and again with Caleb. Back in Numbers 13 and 14, when he spied out the land, he trusted God's strength. He was ready to go in. Even though it seemed impossible to take the land, he was ready. He trusted God's strength. We see it here in verse 12. It says, Joshua 14, verse 12, it says, Give me this hill country that the Lord promised to me that day. You yourselves heard that then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. He asks now for his inheritance and he asks for the hill country. It's fortified. This would have been the hardest place to take. This fortified area, and as well, not only fortified, but it has the Anakites there, who are descendants of the giants. These giants, Numbers uh, 13, 33 shows us this. This would have been the hardest one to conquer, and yet, in faith, he asks for that as his inheritance. Why? Because he has faith in God. He trusts in God's strength, and it really shows here. He has such faith in God. It's because he doesn't see things from a human perspective. Caleb sees things from God's perspective. And those giants look like grasshoppers from God's perspective. And that's how Caleb sees it. A faith in God needs to see from God's perspective, not from ours. For us, things seem impossible. So many things seem impossible, but not for God. And when we see from God's perspective, we will be able to do so much in His service. Things that will seem far too costly, that will seem far too hard, that will seem humanly foolish if we go and do them in his service or seem impossible, we can do when we have a faith in God and see from his perspective. So here we see a wholehearted following of God involves faith, seeing God as worthy to be trusted and committing all that you are to all that he can do. That's what it is to wholeheartedly follow God. Secondly, though, in Caleb, we see that this wholehearted following, at the center of it, is a believing in God's promises. This is really important. 
Caleb wholeheartedly follows God because he believes God's promises. This is what enables it in him. He comes here to Joshua in chapter 14 with this request to receive what he's been promised. You can see that in verse 9 to 12 if you want to have a look. I won't read it. But he comes and three times he refers to receiving what he's promised. He's demanding what he has been promised. And this is what it is to wholeheartedly follow God. Caleb hasn't really spoken up through the the story as Israel's wandered for the 40 years in the wilderness. He hasn't spoken up much. But now that the time has come to receive what he's promised, he speaks up. It's like he's been waiting for this time. It's like that future promise of what he knows is to come has enabled him to push on and he's waited here for this moment. He's waited here for this moment to receive what he has promised, what God has promised him. And we need to be people who believe God's promises, who hope in God's promises to be able to wholeheartedly follow him. It's the only way. That's how it was for John Patton that we saw at the beginning. That's what enabled him to follow God through hard, hard times. It's God's promises. That promise in Matthew 28. It was the same for Caleb, and it needs to be the same for us. So what promises are enabling you to follow God? What promises are you clinging to to get you through? What promises are you going to? We need to have them in our head. We need to lock them in so that we will be able to follow God when it seems impossible to do, when it seems stupid in everyone else's eyes to follow him in that way, when it seems like it costs too much to lay aside that sin or to follow him in a certain way, we need to lay up in our head God's promises and cling to them in those moments to be able to wholeheartedly follow him. So go and get to know God's promises. Go to his word and see what God has promised in Christ. I don't have time to tell you them all, but there are so many in his word, so go to them. Thirdly, in Caleb we see a wholehearted following. It's enabled by and it's characterized by conviction and courage to do what's right. Look at verse 7 and 8 in chapter 14. It says there, Caleb speaking, he says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Caleb doesn't go with the majority. He doesn't follow the crowd. He doesn't give in to the pressure around him, even if he's on his own. And everyone else is saying, it's stupid, it's foolish, you shouldn't do it, we shouldn't do it. It would have looked foolish to go up and take the land then. There was giants... There were well-fortified cities. It was well-populated. It would have been difficult for Israel to conquer the land. It seemed impossible. But Caleb has conviction and courage to do what he knows right is right. And we need to be like this. Despite the pressure that is around us, we need to be able to wholeheartedly follow God in this way by being willing to at times stand alone. It will at times mean standing alone. We need to be people who will go and stand against the crowd, who will wholeheartedly follow God, though at times it's going to look foolish to everyone around you. It's going to look foolish to the world when you follow God. You're going to get picked on and persecuted. You're going to have to miss out on pleasures that might look so good in the moment. And it's going to look, seem foolish. But we need to be willing to stand alone, to not give in to the pressure of what everything else around us is saying is good, and instead have the conviction to know what is right and do what is right. And this is what Caleb was like. Too often we're people who just give in to the pressures around us. It's so easy to just give in to peer pressure and what people are telling us and what everyone else is doing. But we need among us people that will stand against the current, that won't just go with the flow of everything else, but who will be willing to stand alone. And that's what it is to wholeheartedly follow God. That's what it will look like at times, standing alone. It might mean sticking out, standing out like a thorn among roses. That's how people will view you as a Christian at times when you wholeheartedly follow God. They'll see you as a thorn and annoying. Even in the church at times, people who wholeheartedly follow God will stand out 
big time, even in the church. Caleb stood out big time in Israel, God's people. The people that wholeheartedly follow God will stand out even in the church. Well, here in Numbers 14, we, uh, we see as well, Numbers 14, back to Numbers 14, we saw how Caleb, he stuck to his convictions. He didn't get give in. The whole of Israel was saying, we can't do it, but he stood, he stood strong and he said what he thought and he trusted God. Two more, here we see, wholehearted following is characterized and enabled by determination and initiative. Caleb had a great determination here. It comes when, we see it when he comes asking for what God has promised. And he asks as well for the hardest land to take. Something that would have been so difficult to take. We saw that in verse 11 and 12. Caleb is active and he actually gets rid of the inhabitants. We see that in chapter 15 as well. We won't look at it, but we see that in chapter 15. He removes the inhabitants and then he's able to give parts of the land. He's able to give part of the land to the do- his daughter because he has actually conquered all that land. He was determined He took initiative and he conquered. And all of that, it's so important to see, wasn't fueled in him. It wasn't his strength that brought all of that about. It was God's. Back in Numbers 14, it said about Caleb, he had a different spirit in him. He was someone who trusted God and had God's spirit working in him. That's the only thing that enabled all of this and allowed all of this. So we need to be here like Caleb. We need to be like this, and we need to be willing, like we said before, and determined to stand alone and follow God when it will be hard, when we will be alone. We will look like a fool when we speak God's wisdom, but we need to be determined in that and continue in that. We will look like a fool when we speak of what God says on abortion in this world and on homosexuality. And on so many issues that God speaks of, we will look like fools when we give up the Australian dream or when we don't want to retire and we give up maybe our retirement or our travel plans or something else to go for God's kingdom and spread his kingdom to people that are lost. We will look like fools when we do that, when we give up that well-paying career to serve God's kingdom and follow him in that way. We're going to look like fools when we do that. People, even in the church, will see you as foolish. But Caleb had conviction to do what seemed foolish, to do what was costly, because he had that deep faith in God. A final thing, as we wrap up, we need to see here how Caleb's wholehearted following, it was really enabled by this expectation of the future inheritance that he had. That's what was enabling his wholehearted following We saw it again and again how he was eager for this inheritance. It's like this had it's it's like this inheritance had pushed him on to follow God, continue following God, because he knew what was coming. It had been forty-five years since he got that promise. He'd waited and waited for it. And now he speaks up and he knew that he he was about to get what he had longed for and waited for. And it seems that inheritance that he was going to have pushed him on and helped him to continue to follow God because this is at the heart of what he's demanding here in chapter 14. And, And I think we need to see here that wholehearted following of God can be enabled by this expectation of a future inheritance. That can be enabled, it can be enabled in us when we expect and long for that future inheritance. If we see what is to come, it will help us follow God wholeheartedly. So this is what Caleb was like. This is how he wholeheartedly followed God. And this is what we need to grow in as well. We need to grow to wholeheartedly follow God like this. And and I say that word, grow there, very importantly. It's very important that we realize this. We need to grow into this. We are not going to be like this the day we are born again and saved. We are not going to be like Caleb. Caleb here is 85 years old. At 40 years old, back in Numbers 13 and 14, we see the courage that he had, the trust in God that he had. Now he's 45 years older and he's continued in following God. And look how God has grown him. We may not look exactly like Caleb the day we are saved, but we are to strive for this. This is the picture of what God wants in all his people as we follow him. And as well, I want us just to remember as we come to an end, I want us to remember that hero isn't Caleb. As we look at this passage and we've focused on Caleb, he's not the hero. 
God is. The one he followed is the hero. And this passage is pointing to God and his promises and those things that we can trust and how he will one day bring a future inheritance that he has purchased. And that needs to be what we're longing for. A verse that I really love in 1 Peter says, 1 Peter 3, 18 says, Christ died for your sins once for all the righteous, for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Christ, who was perfect, died for our sins. He was perfect, he was righteous, and yet he died for us who are unrighteous. And why did he do it? What was the reason, main reason? It was to bring us to God. That's the inheritance we long for. The inheritance we long for in heaven is actually to be with God. And if he isn't there, it's not the inheritance we should be longing for. That's what we should be wanting. And that future inheritance to be with God is what should enable us to wholeheartedly follow him in this life, like I said before. That's what helped Caleb. And that's what should help us. And I want to read one example in Hebrews 10 as we close now that I read this, this week that helped me and I think should help you to wholeheartedly follow God, no, no matter the cost. In great measure, wholeheartedly follow God because you know the future hope. You know the inheritance to come. Have a look at Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 verse 32 shows a people here who wholeheartedly follow God in extreme circumstances because they know the future inheritance to come. Hebrews 10, verse 32 says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood on your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Here is a group of people that went through suffering and they went through suffering partly because they aligned themselves with these Christians who were in prison, who were being persecuted. And they aligned themselves with these Christians knowing that when they did this, their properties and their things would be taken and plundered. Why did they do that? Because they knew they had a better and lasting possession. Would we be people who would do that? Would you align yourself with someone if you knew every possession you have that you hold to so dearly and that you spend all your time and money on was going to be taken away? Would you align yourself with a Christian if you knew that was going to happen in your life? Would you wholeheartedly follow God in that way? Would you lay aside great treasures in your life for the sake of God's kingdom, for the sake of his people? Would you do it? The only way that you could is obviously by God's strength, but as well here we're seeing the only way we can do it is if we are enabled by that future inheritance, if we realize that we have a greater and lasting possession in heaven with God, who is far greater than anything we could have here. That is what enables wholehearted following in us. And so we need to know and long for that future inheritance if we are to live like Caleb. If there is to be Caleb's among us, and we need them, if there are to be John Patton's among us, or people like the ones in Hebrews 10 among us, then we need to know our future inheritance. We need to know it and we need to long for that rather than getting gripped by everything we have now. So may we be people who wholeheartedly follow God. May we have a faith in God that allows us to consistently, completely and undividedly lay aside what you desire for what God desires. May we be people like that. Will you be someone like that? And will God say that about you one day as he did with Caleb? Let's pray. Our great God, we come to you now and we really ask that you would help us to see
the weight of these things that we are considering. I pray that you would cover the flaws of me and my words and by your spirit bring a deeper conviction to people, the conviction that they need. That they would see the desperate need they have, God, to follow you in this way. I pray that you'd bring about, God, in us as a church, a a people that would surrender our lives to you, that we would yield all that we are, everything that we have, all that we are, God, that we would yield and surrender it to you because of all that you are and because of all that you can do for us. Please, God, make us like this. Cause us to be people that would wholeheartedly follow you and may we all stand out in this area. May we stand out. May we look so different because of how we wholeheartedly follow you and may this bring others into your kingdom. Please, God, we pray that you would really grow us in this and I pray that you would just fill in so many things that we haven't been able to cover, so many other things that could have been said. God, you know what should have been said tonight and I pray that you would fill this in that by your spirit you could bring the conviction we need and that you would grow us into a church that follows you in this way, God. Please raise up amongst us people like Caleb, people like John Patton and so many others in history. Raise them up in us, God. We long for it and we desperately, desperately need it. So please do this work in us, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together a song which is really like that prayer